resources will come to order. The subcommittee is meeting today to hear testimony on exploring energy challenges and opportunities facing Puerto Rico. Under committee rule 4F, any oral opening statements at hearings are limited to the chairman and the ranking member and the vice chairman and a designee of the ranking member. This will help us to hear from our witnesses sooner and help members keep to their schedules. Therefore, I ask unanimous consent that all other members' opening statements be made part of the hearing record if they are submitted to the subcommittee clerk by 5 p.m. today. Hearing no objection, so ordered. I also ask unanimous consent that the gentleman from Puerto Rico, Mr. Paraluisi, the gentle lady from New York, Ms. Velasquez, and the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Gutierrez, be allowed to sit on the dais and participate, excuse me, and the, also the gentleman from New York, Mr. Serrano, be allowed to sit on the dais and participate in today's hearing. And lastly, should his schedule permit, I also ask that the gentleman from Alaska, Mr. Young, be allowed to sit on the dais and participate as well. Hearing no objection, so ordered. Before we get started, it is important to explain that this hearing is not about Chapter 9 of the Bankruptcy Code. The Bankruptcy Code is within the jurisdiction of the House Judiciary Committee. This hearing and any subsequent hearing held by this committee will focus on other issues. I now recognize myself for an opening statement. Today we are here to discuss the very challenging energy situation in Puerto Rico. At the forefront is the Puerto Rico Electric Power Authority, or PREPA, which is a fiscal and managerial disaster. With over $9 billion in debt and an increasingly uncertain future, PREPA represents one of the greatest challenges facing Puerto Rico. This crisis did not arise overnight. Rather, it has developed because of major issues within PREPA that were allowed to stagnate into the situation that we face today. One cannot begin to address the issues surrounding PREPA without first discussing the aged or aged infrastructure that is overwhelmingly reliant on oil. Because of this, Puerto Ricans have historically paid one of the highest electrical rates within the United States. And despite oil prices being the lowest they have been in decades, Puerto Rico residents are still paying an average 50% more on electricity than the United States national average. However, what this statistic fails to capture is the impact the price of energy has on the average resident. When median income is accounted for, keeping an air conditioner on, for instance, for 24 hours has five times the economic impact on the average Puerto Rican than it does for the average citizen on the mainland. Thus, keeping the lights on for an extra hour or two is a serious decision that average residents on the island may face daily. As mentioned, PREPA currently relies on an outdated infrastructure of which over 80% of PREPA's power plants were constructed before 1977. Not only are these plants inefficient, but they are environmentally deficient and unreliable. In fact, PREPA recently acknowledged that modernizing its facilities over the next 20 years would cost approximately $5 billion. The state of energy infrastructure in Puerto Rico represents the sad truth that PREPA cannot make the politically tough decisions. Although it was granted unilateral control over establishing rates, PREPA has failed to update its base rate in 27 years. In other words, PREPA has not been recovering its basic operational and maintenance costs for nearly three decades. Further, PREPA's failure to collect and bill customers has crafted the notion that electricity is not a commodity that needs to be paid for, but rather is an entitlement. Exemplifying this is the shocking fact that PREPA has $1.75 billion in accounts receivable as of September of 2014, of which over $750 million of this was owed by various entities within the Puerto Rican government. In fact, one third of the island receives subsidized rates paying fractional amounts or nothing at all. Finally, the management of PREPA has contributed to an indifferent working environment as bureaucracy and political connections have stood in the place of merit and hard work. For instance, each new Puerto Rican administration since 2001 has gutted the administration of PREPA. As such, there has existed no path to leadership and has encouraged an environment without individual accountability or goals. Going forward, PREPA not only needs to address its overwhelming financial crisis, 
but it must also address the systemic issues that hamstring its ability to become an efficient and adaptive utility. For instance, increased privatization through public-private partnerships or power purchase operating agreements would provide opportunities for PREPA to evolve by putting electric generation in private entities not bogged down by political and bureaucratic concerns. Unfortunately for PREPA, there is no easy solution. Blanket grants of debt restructuring would be irresponsible and would merely punt the hard decisions to future generations. The way forward will be politically challenging, but we owe it to the future not to bypass this opportunity. Uh, at this point, I would like to recognize the ranking member of the subcommittee or his designee for an opening statement. Thank you, Chairman Lambert. I ask unanimous consent that my longer statement be included in the record. See no, see no objections ordered. This is the sixth hearing on Puerto Rico in the 114th Congress. While Congress has debated this matter, the situation has gone from bad to worse. In 2015, migration from Puerto Rico to the States was the highest in modern history. The territory government has been unable to provide tax refunds, pay contractors, and make pension contributions. Two public entities missed payments to bondholders, leading to a lawsuit by two bond, insurance bond insurers. There will likely be larger defaults and more lawsuits later this year. I don't know which stakeholders think they will benefit from this situation, but I know it won't be my constituents or the vast majority of Puerto Rico's creditors. The crisis in Puerto Rico is the joint responsibility of the Puerto Rico government, whose policies and practices have often been irresponsible, and the federal government, whose policies towards Puerto Rico have clearly been inequitable. As a territory, Puerto Rico lacks democracy, justice, and power. This undignified status must be discarded. If these hearings are merely a forum for Congress to criticize the Puerto Rico government, while disregarding its own contribution to the crisis, this is not a constructive exercise. My constituents are hurting, and they're seeking a hand up, not a hand out. Congress should empower them, not reprimand them. Although it is not the subject of this hearing, Congress should enact legislation that authorizes Puerto Rico to restructure a meaningful portion of its debt, as every state is authorized to do, and that provides Puerto Rico with better treatment on their federal programs. I would support the creation of a board to help the Puerto Rico government improve its fiscal practices, but only if Congress provides Puerto Rico with reasonable tools and more equitable treatment. Of course, the high cost of electricity for households and businesses in Puerto Rico hampers economic growth and spurs migration. So the legislation could include provisions to make power more affordable in the territory. For example, Congress has enacted a law requiring the Secretary of the Interior to appoint a team of experts to develop an energy action plan for Puerto Rico. But Interior claims it does not have the funding to proceed. Congress should reassign responsibility for the plan to the Department of Energy and ensure it is swiftly prepared. Congress also should treat Puerto Rico equally under LIHIP, which helps households pay their electric bills. I persuaded the federal government to take administrative steps to increase Puerto Rico's LIHIP funding from $4 million to $15 million a year. But state-like treatment could translate into $24 million a year. On the other hand, federal tax credits to encourage households to install renewable energy technology do not benefit Puerto Rico. Congress should authorize the Puerto Rico government to offer the credits through its local tax system, with the federal government reimbursing the territory government for the lost revenue. Congress also has authorized, but never funded, two territory specific grant programs to help Puerto Rico reduce its dependence on foreign oil and improve its electricity distribution system. Congress should appropriate money for these programs. In addition, Congress should enact my legislation 
to increase the number of ships qualified to transport LNG from the states to Puerto Rico and require DOE to prepare a report on the prospect of the territory becoming a hub for the distribution of American-produced energy in the Caribbean region. Meanwhile, on the Puerto Rico level, operations at PREPA require fundamental reform. After becoming PREPA's chief restructuring officer in 2014, Ms. Donahue, who's here present, observed that PREPA was far behind the industry in virtually every respect. I will ask Ms. Donahue for a progress report during the course of this hearing. PREPA must diversify its fuel supply, re reducing reliance on petroleum and boosting use of natural gas and renewable energy. The private sector should have a larger role in developing Puerto Rico's energy system. PREPA currently purchases electricity generated by two private companies, and, ad and additional public-private partnerships could benefit co consumers. Finally, I will ask Ms. Donahue about the debt restructuring agreement PREPA signed with 70% of its bondholders, now pending before the Puerto Rico legislature. As Ms. Donahue will note, it took PREPA over 15 months to negotiate the agreement because PREPA lacks access to an orderly debt restructuring process, such as Chapter 9. The burden is on the government of Puerto Rico to make the case that this agreement is in the best interests of the American citizens of Puerto Rico. Thank you. I yield back. I thank Mr. Perluisi for his statement. And I'd now like to recognize the ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Gajalva of Arizona, for an opening statement. Thank you very, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, for your courtesy. Uh, we appreciate um, you scheduling this hearing in response to Speaker Ryan's instructions to this committee to craft a responsible solution to Puerto Rico's budget uh, disaster, indeed crisis, by the end of March. While exploring the energy challenges and opportunities facing Puerto Rico is a wor worthwhile topic, albeit somewhat disjointed from the fiscal reality that is going on right now in Puerto Rico, a larger, there's a larger issue here in Congress. Congress is denying Puerto Rico the ability to have an orderly restructuring of its unpayable debt. It's a major reason for the debt crisis. It's the main barrier to recovery. And that's even one of the primary energy challenges facing Puerto Rico. That's what we should be discussing today. According to the Treasury Department, which has been assisting the island with its debt issues, Puerto Rico is insolvent. Last June, Governor Garcia Padilla announced that Puerto Rico would not pay its debts. His government defaulted on $58 million in bond principal and interest payments in August and again in January. The governor has been looking through the cushions of his government's couch to find ways to maintain these bond payments. This means other bonds have had to go unpaid, causing some insurance of, of Puerto Rican bonds to file suit against the government. It's just the beginning of what is expected to be a flood of expensive, chaotic litigation, which, on, which only a federal debt debt restructuring process can prevent. The Puerto Rican government is robbing Peter to pay Paul. Sometime in the next three to six months, they will no longer be able to be able to pay Paul or anyone else. This, is, this, this will deepen profoundly the human, human, humanitarian crisis on the island that we have been warned about, which is coming. We cannot allow this to happen. Our fellow American citizens in Puerto Rico deserve much better. The island continues to suffer from decades of economic decline and will not be able to turn things around without congressional action. They can't repair the economy until they deal with the debt problem. They can't provide cost-effective energy until they raise billions of dollars to upgrade their old and dysfunctional power generation and distribution infrastructure. These billions will be impossible to raise or borrow until an orderly debt restructuring brings everyone to the table and helps them repair their credit. Meanwhile, Puerto Rican families are forced to suffer more and more from brutal budget cuts. Last September, my staff put out a report called Profit at Any Cost, How Hedge Funds Win by Making Sure Puerto Rico Loses. It shows how vulture hedge funds helped cause the Puerto Rican debt crisis and are now standing in the way of resolving it. Since then, these funds have been 
using their influence in the courts and through political channels to stop all debt restructuring plans not on their terms. They are relying on their status as Puerto Rico's only remaining lender to push extreme cuts to basic services that will, if enacted, increase their profits even more. In the meantime, the island continues to bleed residents who see relocation to Florida or elsewhere on the mainland as their only hopes for survival. By some estimation, up to 100,000 Puerto, Puerto Ricans are expected to have left the island in 2015. Much more pain in the name of austerity will be inflicted on the people of Puerto Rico if Congress continues to put the demands of hedge funds ahead of the needs of families. There is no reason they should have to pay for the risky investment decisions made by other people. I urge this committee to put the American citizens of Puerto Rico first and allow this island to access bankruptcy protection. Mr. Chairman, again, thank you for your courtesy, and I yield back. Okay, thank you. I'd now like to introduce our witnesses. I appreciate every one of you being here today and serving uh, as witnesses on this panel. We have Ms. Lisa, Lisa Donahue, Managing Partner, excuse me, Managing Director of Alex Partners. Mr. Jorge San Miguel, Chair of Environmental Law, Energy and Land Use of Ferreira Yili LLC. Mr. Carlos Rivera Velez, Chairman of the Board of the Puerto Rico Manufacturers Association. Mr. Hosan Rossi, Chairman of the Board, Institute for a Sustainable and Competitive Economy of Puerto Rico. And Mr. Jaime Sanabria Hernandez, Co-President and General Manager for Finance and, and Administration of Eco Electrica LP. Hope I pronounced every one of those names and organizations correctly. Uh, let me remind the witnesses that under our committee rules, they must limit their oral statements to five minutes but their entire statement will appear in the hearing record. When you begin, the lights on your witness table will turn green. After four minutes, the yellow light comes on, and your time will have expired when the red light comes on. And at that point, I would ask that you complete your statement. I would also like to ask the entire test, uh, panel to testify uh, before the members at the dais ask any questions. We will now start in order, and the chair recognizes Ms. Donahue to testify. Thank you, Chairman Lamborn, Ranking Member Lowenthal, Full Committee Ranking Member Grijalva, Resident Commissioner Pierre Luisi, and members of the subcommittee. My name is Lisa Donahue. I am the Chief Restructuring Officer of the Puerto Rico Electric Power Authority, or PREPA. PREPA produces and delivers virtually all of the Commonwealth's electric power. PREPA owes approximately $9 billion to creditors. Absent of financial restructuring, it will run out of money in the first half of 2016. Its problems are the results of choices made over decades, often driven by political or electoral considerations rather than best practices or business imperatives. Energy costs in Puerto Rico are high, but PREPA's costs are not fully covered by its existing rate structure. The rate deficit, that is, the difference between the rate charged and PREPA's actual costs, including existing debt service, is nearly eight cents per kilowatt hour. PREPA also faces challenges because its infrastructure is outdated, inefficient, and does not currently comply with environmental regulations. PREPA has developed a recovery plan to transform into a modern utility. The recovery plan is based on an equitable burden-sharing approach and involves three core goals. One, improving operations, efficiency, and therefore cost structure. Two, investing in infrastructure. And three, achieving a sustainable capital structure. PREPA has focused its operational improvement efforts across the enterprise. Through continued focus and use of cross-functional teams, PREPA has achieved hundreds of millions of dollars in one-time and recurring savings. PREPA has also developed a comprehensive long-term capital plan that assumes $2.4 billion in new investments. The plan improves fuel diversity by shifting away from fuel oil toward natural gas and renewables. The plan also provides for critical investments in the transmission and distribution system. The plan includes an RFP to solicit bids for third-party investment in its infrastructure. We are interested in attracting the most efficient capital and expertise to help us execute the plan. PREPA's leaders and employees will continue to be critical to ensuring that it's able to execute the plan. Governance reforms pending before Puerto Rico's Legislative Assembly will promote independence to ensure that the changes are sustainable. 
In parallel, PREPA is working to instill a culture of meritocracy and accountability. It is also focused on achieving a sustainable debt structure. We cannot expect any one constituent to carry all of the burden. All stakeholders should contribute and support PREPA's transformation. To that end, in December of 2015, PREPA reached a restructuring support agreement, or RSA, with creditors representing approximately 70% of its debt. The RSA outlines a comprehensive restructuring plan to reduce PREPA's debt burden while also increasing liquidity. These are all positive developments, but PREPA's transformation is far from complete. The RSA is subject to many contingencies. First, the RSA is with only a portion of our creditors. In order to consummate the restructuring agreement, additional bondholders must participate. Approximately $2.7 billion in bonds have not yet agreed to the restructuring, and we need $2 billion of those bonds to be exchanged voluntarily for the deal to become effective. Second, the new securitization bonds must receive an investment grade rating, which is challenging as the rating will depend at least in part on the Commonwealth's financial situation. Third, the Puerto Rico legislature must approve legislation acceptable to the RSA creditors to reform PREPA's governance, authorize the securitization bonds, and make other changes to facilitate the transformation. If it became available, an orderly, an orderly restructuring regime under the bankruptcy code would greatly help PREPA efficiently implement the agreement with its creditors. It would allow the supermajority of supporting creditors to bind holdout creditors. It would improve the deal economics by ensuring 100% participation, and it would provide a faster process with greater legal certainty under the leadership of a federal judge. The stakes are high, and the human consequences of inaction are real. It goes without saying that electricity is the lifeblood of the Commonwealth. If the RSA terminates or we cannot consummate the recovery plan, we will be back to square one. PREPA could run out of money. Fuel supply could dry up. The safety and welfare of the Commonwealth and its people would be endangered. For these reasons, consummating PREPA's restructuring is critical to the social and economic well-being of the Commonwealth and its people. Thank you for the opportunity to participate in this hearing. I look forward to your questions. Okay, thank you. The chair now recognizes Mr. San Miguel to testify. Thank you. Chairman Lamborn, Ranking Member Pierluisi, and members of the committee, good morning and thank you. Puerto Rico's energy crisis has a solution and must be resolved now. Energy, after all, is the backbone of our economy and the basis of our future. As I will discuss, most of the remaining actions required are local. Yet given the historic juncture, the risks involved, and our poor track record, it is my view that Congress should consider providing certain structured leadership and reform oversight. By way of background, PREPA has faced internal challenges for decades now. Its 1941 structure is outdated and unfit for today's economy. PREPA is a government-controlled, top-down structure. Its median generating plant age, for example, is 44 years when compared to industry average of 18. And in fact, 80% of such plants are over 25 years. Further, PREPA electricity losses are estimated at 15% due to technical and non-technical losses, where industry standard is estimated at 7%. This alone means approximately two to three hundred million dollars a year in losses, and there is much more. But there's also external challenges, like the island's deepening recession and migration uptick, among others. The result? Historically high and volatile energy prices, as well as inconsistent power quality, which has weighed down hard and strong on our economy and our citizens. PREPA needs a new focus. It must shift attention to the transmission and distribution business, divorce itself from the energy generation component, and leverage the private sector expertise and capital to construct and efficiently operate new generation facilities. Reforms must be quick and clear to achieve, number one, price reductions and stability, number two, modernization, number three, environmental protection, and number four, economic development and growth. Transparency and credibility will be key ingredients in any restructuring effort. PREPA today appears to be achieving levels of internal transparency not seen before, though much more is needed. Operational efficiencies are starting to take hold. Yet the most important steps remain ahead of us, and significantly, most of these are within Puerto Rico's control. Let's review three such key actions. First, the government of Puerto Rico must quickly approve the PREPA Revitalization Act or a similar version. This bill was proposed by the current administration on November 4, 2015. 
Second, we need an emergency permit reform. Permitting in Puerto Rico is a historic and unacceptable nightmare. Large infrastructure projects normally take eight to 10 years to fully permit and construct. Puerto Rico does not have the luxury of time to modernize and reform its energy infrastructure. Fortunately, under Act 76 of 2000, the Emergencies Act, the governor is expressly authorized to declare an emergency and provide for expedited permitting authority via executive order. Emergencies under this law exist if there is any event or grave problems of deterioration in the physical infrastructure for the rendering of essential services to the people. Electricity is an essential service, and by the government's own admission, its infrastructure is significantly deteriorated. As for the third key action, Puerto Rico's Energy Commission must expedite the approval of a revised rate schedule and complete the evaluation of the Integrated Resource Plan, the IRP. Given the advanced negotiations between PREPA and most of its creditors, the Energy Commission should take all necessary temporary rate adjustment measures while the formal application process is completed. As to the IRP, it should complete the approval process to enable PREPA to establish the footprint of its, of its infrastructure reform and business plan. Now, regarding a federal role, as in any other state, infrastructure projects will require federal approvals. Yet federal interagency action can also take considerable time. Congress could consider a structure like a temporary emergency permitting and oversight task force or control board to dovetail with a local enhanced permitting structure. This board could be tasked with expediting the joint review and approval of permits in addition to grants, loans, and loan guarantees from existing programs. It could also ensure with congressional authority that PREPA is in fact reformed for good. With these action items in place, PREPA will begin regaining needed credibility immediately thereafter in collaboration with the government, both local and federal, as well as the private sector. PREPA must quickly address the power quality of the grid. This is affecting new manufacturing investment on the island and seriously threatening existing ones. In other words, jobs, existing and new. Concurrently, and to provide the lowest possible cost of electricity, it must maximize operational efficiencies quickly leverage private sector capital and proponents to construct new state-of-the-art base load generation capacity and maximize the expansion and assimilation of renewable energy portfolio. In closing, it's clear that PREPA structure is outmoded and an impediment to growth. Unleashing long-term private sector efficiencies and credibility is key. Puerto Rico has the tools to finish the job at PREPA and together with the federal government, we must. There is no turning back or a later chance. It's time to move forward now. Inaction is not an option, and further studies less so. We know the way. The question is, well, we have the will. The perfect cannot be the enemy of the good. We need to stop saying no and begin working on yes. And that means putting special interests and personal pride aside for the good of our economy, its growth, and opportunities. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. The chair now recognizes Mr. Rivera Velez to testify. Good morning. My name is Carlos uh, Rivera Velez and I am here today on behalf of Puerto Rico's private sector coalition, PSC representing 100% of the private sector and comprised of 30 organizations. We thank you, Mr. Chairman and subcommittee members for today's hearing. I am also the, the elected chair of the Puerto Rico Manufacturers Association, PRMA, which is the largest trade uh, association comprised of approximately 1,200 companies representing the manufacturing sector, employing almost 350,000 U.S. citizens and over 80,000 uh, Americans stateside. Manufacturing alone represents 50% of the island's uh, GDP. We pay the highest wages, generate three jobs for every direct job, and provide over one half of the local government's current tax base. I am also Vice President of Manufacturing and General Manager of Federal Life Sciences in Puerto Rico, which directly employs approximately 1,000 U.S. citizens. Uh, recently, the PSC met with a number of your colleagues to recommend a five-point program towards economic development, highlighting energy as a top issue. Energy costs in Puerto Rico far outweigh similar costs on the mainland and hamper our ability to compete globally. We know the current MOU between the DOE and Puerto Rico must be renewed and re-strategized now. We also ask the Insular Affairs Office of the Interior Department to be funded now 
to complete work with Puerto Rico on modeling and implementing a competitive and sustained energy <laughs> solution. Locally, we advocate for an agenda at intended to transform the electrical system and enable sustained economic development. Seems like a structure and competitive conscious debt restructuring, the assertive integration of renewable uh, energy uh, sources, the modernization of the infrastructure, cleaner and cheaper fuel sources, uh, and the full empowerment of the Independent Energy Commission representing consumers, commerce, and industry to oversee the whole process of setting utility prices, among others. Dedicated and sound resources are needed to provide robust tools to allow the local commission to impact and do its job in a level playing field. My main responsibilities as an operational leader include ensuring expected results are met within the planned budget for the year while reducing costs annually in order to ensure products remain competitive globally. Energy costs play a major role in the daily management of any operation, especially those that are equipment intensive. Energy costs in Puerto Rico for the last 15 years have been unstable and unpredictable, trending upwards from 11 cents kilowatt hour in 1999 all the way up to 30 cents kilowatt hour in 2012. Today, we're almost twice the US average despite lower oil prices. To make things worse, there are proposals to increase energy prices even more above the current ones in order to facilitate prepas restructuring and debt servicing resulting in average Puerto Rico prices for all sectors combined versus that of the U.S. to be 3.3 times 2014 prices. Anyone with a simple understanding of operating a business appreciates how devastating this change would be and its consequences to our economy. As you know, PREPA has depended on oil to power its electricity generators since the 1940s. History has taught us that oil prices can change drastically in a short period of time, and Puerto Rico is vulnerable to price swings. PREPA has been very slow to evolve. Many local businesses and manufacturers have taken their own initiatives to lower cost. At my facility, as an example, we have invested over a million dollars just to convert to LED lighting and install more efficient equipment as part of an energy cost reduction strategy. Several large operations in manufacturing, consumer products, and retail markets have actually installed their own electricity generation capacity on site to ensure adequate power at a lower price, like cogeneration with propane, large solar panel arrays, etc. Notably, PREPA has resisted the ability of these companies to sell back to the grid or to initiate the practice of wheeling and sell to a neighboring facility. So small businesses cut costs by turning off the air conditioner or use it partially, use only a portion of the lights in the showroom, and lay off employees. In many cases, energy costs are significantly higher than payroll expenses. In the end, consumers will face higher prices and will look elsewhere, reducing demand, costing jobs for U.S. citizens in Puerto Rico and the main mainland. Let me illustrate the example of a manufacturing plant. As despite our current challenges today, in Puerto Rico, we continue to be a manufacturing powerhouse. Every time there are energy cost increases, the following dynamics occur in any manufacturing plant in Puerto Rico. The general manager needs to explain the financial variances and the reasons for it. He or she needs to look at implementing ways to compensate for the cost increase, typically reverting to decisions involving downsizing employment, delaying or canceling new investments or expansions. Corporations differ from bringing new products to the local plants if they are heavy on capital equipment. Workers at all levels become very aware of the previous challenges at the working place when combined with their own energy cost challenges as, as consumers, it contributes to a suboptimal working environment. For this and many other reasons, we believe providing a competitive and modern long-term energy platform and low costs is key to Puerto Rico's economic recovery. Thank you all, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. The chair now recognizes Mr. Rossi to testify. Thank you, Chairman Lamborn, and uh, thank you, uh, committee members. Uh, I also thank you for uh, electing to talk about energy challenges and opportunities facing Puerto Rico. As you do so, I believe you're also talking about, about the possibility to restructure uh, a, a Puerto Rico's economy for the good if we restructure the energy system, not just PREPA, uh, for the good. I am I'm chairman of IRECO uh, Enterprises. 
I was past president of the Puerto Rico Manufacturers Association uh, as we battled uh, to bring uh, a regulatory framework, an independent body similar to the U.S. Uh, states uh, and, and the U.S. citizens enjoy uh, uh, when they consider their future energy plants and the, and the tariffs are considered. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm happy to say that we have that kind of regulatory framework in Puerto Rico today uh, uh, thanks to uh, 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 winning those battles uh, uh, politically. It was enacted in 2014. It started working in 2015. And it seems to be uh, 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 disregarded currently, uh, not just by PREPA, but by a lot of our political leadership as, as an important tool to legally, uh, morally, politically uh, restructure our energy system. Uh, and PREPA should be completely subject, uh, as well as its future plans, including the integrated resource plan that is present in, in proceedings in our energy commission in Puerto Rico, should be, should be fully responsible to provide the information and be subject to the scrutiny of our regulatory body. Uh, additionally, I propose uh, that federal government has a role in this. There have been promises by the White House Task Force on Puerto Rico uh, to do so over the years as it engages private sector leadership in Puerto Rico, similar to uh, Pierre Luis's, uh, um, a, a, a resident commissioner Pierre Luis's comments. Uh, the DOI uh, uh, has been tasked with, with that as well by Congress, hasn't acted uh, on it. The DOE recently, uh, in 2000, uh, early 2015, started uh, implementation of, of its, uh, they call it the uh, 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 playbook, uh, implementation of, of uh, an MOU with the government of Puerto Rico to assist uh, 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 technically with these, uh, uh, with these improvements to our capacity building. Uh, uh, everybody in the private sector uh, coalesced around the idea that the federal government could, uh, through the DOE's technical expertise, improve our regulatory uh, framework. Nothing has happened uh, uh, with that yet of any substance. So, uh, in essence, uh, I wanted to convey to the panel uh, today and to the subcommittee that Puerto Ricans have tools, legal tools, similar to proven tools uh, that the U.S. citizens use every day in the mainland to implement competitive, sustainable energy solutions through participation as now I do chairing the, uh, the uh, institute uh, that presented testimony to you today uh, uh, to achieve a balance that will favor the most amount of investment in the future to resolve the 50% part of the system that is obsolete doesn't work, has no value to us. We shouldn't be paying uh, rates to support that. Nobody here in the States uh, uh, would allow it as an intervener in a, in a, in a regulatory commission uh, 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 to be legally passed uh, those costs uh, to us. And from there, we can plan a, a, not just a restructuring, a five-year restructuring plan, but we can plan for a restructuring of the whole system that attracts private sector capital, competitive sector capital, uh, that is sustainably reviewed by independent body, not just by PREPA. In addition, I would like to mention that ideas have been brought forth that uh, I fully support, uh, and many others in Puerto Rico. I just want to comment briefly on them. Uh, Puerto Rico should be accepted from the Jones Act provisions regarding national gas maritime transports for the reasons mentioned here. Uh, federal debt guarantees, DOE uh, uh, has capacity, legal capacity, or a, a modifications to the ITC tax credits for renewable energies in Puerto Rico, given tax situations, cash grants uh, uh, would be a better option to spur the type of investment that federal and state governments here have spurred in, in new innovative distributed energy solutions. Uh, I would support that. Additionally, I would support uh, that uh, federal guarantees be provided to new strategic natural gas uh, uh, 
uh, uh, storage and distribution infrastructure in Puerto Rico as long as the federal government is not supporting the creation of a new monopoly on uh, key fossil fuel, not just to lowering cost in Puerto Rico uh, to 16 cents a kilowatt hour, uh, which has been the goal that we have been advocating in Puerto Rico Manufacturers Association over a year, but also uh, uh, we make sure we pass on natural gas to businesses and commerce in a competitive manner. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And the chair would now recognize Mr. Santabria Hernandez to testify. Mr. Chairman, ranking members of the subcommittee and members of the subcommittee, thank you for inviting me to discuss our perspective on some of the energy challenges faced by Puerto Rico. As you are aware, we submitted a more detailed testimony than what we will be presenting here this morning. I ask that you incorporate that detailed testimony as part of the record on today's hearing. I would like to start out by pointing out a few simple facts that underscore the urgency of our work. Electricity is an essential building block of the modern world. Application of affordable and dependable energy makes everything we do better. And that includes food production, manufacturing, healthcare, transportation, heating and air conditioning, and you can go on and keep naming them. In our experience, there are three important components of any healthy economic sector. Profitable companies, satisfied consumers, and confident investors. Profitable companies need satisfied consumers. Consumers need to get a good and dependable product at prices they can afford. Investors need assurances that the company is run well and that the political environment is lim or the political involvement is limited. Equelectrica, and as you know, I'm co-president at Equelectrica. Equelectrica was the first independent power producer to supply clean, reliable, and safe energy at a competitive cost to the Puerto Rico Electric Power Authority under a 22-year power purchase agreement. Our facility includes a 507 megawatt power plant and an LNG terminal with a, re with a regasification capability of 366 million cubic feet per day. The 507 megawatts of installed capacity represents approximately 9% of the total installed, installed power capacity on the island. But we supply as much as 17% of all the electricity consumed in Puerto Rico on a daily basis. But there are a few systemic problems in Puerto Rico's energy sector. First, consumers are paying more for energy than they should because of the unstable business environment. The system could attract new, new investment if the business environment were better. The financial crisis in Puerto Rico is real and has caused a deterioration of the overall credit environment. Our counterparties are experiencing some erosion of the credit worthiness, and that has compromised the certainty of getting paid on time. And because we're private business, we depend on getting paid. There is unfortunately a lack of certainty in the legal and regulatory framework. Companies, consumers, and investors in the energy sector in Puerto Rico all need and want PREPA to be successful. To achieve a more stable and, we will say, uh, co uh, environment conducive to investment, we need to see improvements in the following elements of business. First, independence. We think PREPA should be operated as a private business and divorced from intervention from the Puerto Rico government and its institutions. Second, we need more stable leadership at PREPA. During the last several years, PREPA has had numerous CEOs. And one particular case, the, per the person was there for no more than three days. That has its impact on how the business is run. We need certainty. Confidence in the durability of the legal and re regulatory framework is critical. And as you know, Investor confidence is on Dermot if that legal framework and regulatory framework is not structured and, and, and does not uh, represent a confident uh, uh, framework in which to operate. And the credit. Credit, it might serve Puerto Rico's interest to institute and monitor 
a program of federal guarantees as a means towards increased sustainability. In conclusion, in many respects, Puerto Rico faces the same challenges as the rest of the United States. Businesses should be run like businesses without bureaucracies or political institutions, substituting their judgment for those of the people actually trying to operate the business. At the same time, the same time, while we're fixing the current system, we need a bridge. The financial crisis in Puerto Rico is real and will require some time and assistance to be resolved. We look forward to working with you on these issues. Thank you again for inviting me, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you, and I want to thank all five of our witnesses for being here today on this very important issue and for your valuable testimony. I'll start with the first uh, round of uh, f first set of questions. Uh, I would remind all of the members that Committee Rule 3D imposes a five-minute limit on questions. So I will begin, then we'll go with the ranking member, and then we'll continue on from there. Uh, Ms. Donahue, could you comment? I know you've only been there for a year and a half, but are there decisions or policies in place, previous decisions that have been made on Puerto Rico, on the, on the island, that uh, affect the competitiveness or the strength of the economy that you think should be uh, revisited? I think, um, thank you, Chairman. I think, as I mentioned in both my long-form testimony and my short testimony, that the PREPA issue was years, probably decades, in the making. And I think, as other witnesses and, and Commissioner Pierluisi mentioned, one of the challenges that PREPA has, which makes it virtually impossible to do long-term strategic planning, is with every change in administration, the top 150 leaders in the company are switched out. So you're starting fresh. And this type of business, of course, involves long-term planning and long-term investment, which is one of the reasons why we have a 20 or 30 year IRP plan that we're looking at is you have to make critical long-term investment decisions. The permitting process is long and those decisions have frequently been completely overturned. In some cases as much as building a pipeline only to dismantle it. So I do think that the, the structural challenges within PREPA as a result of the shifting political agendas with subsequent administrations make it very difficult for a long-term business to actually to actually operate. Do you have any thoughts about employee benefits or wage laws? Um, as far we did do some benchmarking on the wages and we looked at the baseline salaries and then of course we looked at the benefit packages and compared PREPA to public utilities across the United States as well as like industries in, in Puerto Rico. And what we found as far as the salaries were concerned, we were employing a very skilled labor base, so the salaries were fairly in line. It was on the benefit side that um, we felt that they were higher in some cases significantly higher than um, like utilities across the U.S. and like businesses across Puerto Rico. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mr. San Miguel, you talked about privatization of the generation portion, not the transmission and distribution, but the generation portion of PREPA. Could you elaborate on that a little bit? And, and would that be well received, do you believe, in Puerto Rico? Sure. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the concept there is really going more to a mainland-based uh, business model. I mean, I think we have sitting here with us uh, the representative from Equelectrica. It's one of the two main uh, IPPs, independent power producers, on the island since the 1990s. Um, the, both uh, Equelectrica and the other uh, IPP uh, baseload operation uh, are the two cheapest sources of our energy um, into the PREPA grid. Uh, I think that's um, you know, sufficient exhibit as to the efficiencies with which the private sector operates. Um, the power generation facilities, um, not just on the aging component, on the um, number of employees and so forth, but it's clear that the private market is much more efficient in that. And to the extent that we create the right structure 
uh, through the IRP that Ms. Donahue has been mentioning and that is, uh, pr has been presented uh, for finalization with the Puerto Rico um, Energy Commission, that blueprint then sets the stage and the business model for processes to be engaged, like RFPs, for uh, uh, long-term concessions or public-private partnerships or RFPs that allow the private sector to seek the most efficient capital, construct at the greatest speed, and then operate with the greatest efficiency. And so that's generally what I'm alluding to. Are you aware that there may be investors waiting in the wings to make those kinds of investments should the structure you're talking about be put into place? Uh, in fact, uh, I, I understand uh, there are quite a few. I know from personal knowledge, uh, having been uh, contacted by people who may be interested but are uh, waiting to see if, in fact, the, the things I mentioned, for example, in, in my short version, if Puerto, the, the Puerto Rico legislature approves the Revitalization uh, uh, Act and then the Energy Commission approves revised rates and the IRP, that's when the private sector has visibility and certainty, and that's why I mentioned credibility as a key factor in this reconstruction of PREPA and our energy infrastructure to propel economic development. There are plenty of world-class and U.S.-class uh, proponents waiting to put together transactions that should be very favorable. My strong emphasis on the private sector carrying the generation component is more so because I think, as Ms. Donahue has explained um, and the IRP details, most of the assumptions made in the IRP are rather conservative. So they assume that PREPA will be carrying some or a great part of the capital expenditure. The view I'm trying to push is that that should not be on PREPA's back. You let the private sector do that, they do it much more efficiently, and those efficiencies are passed on to consumers. Okay, thank you. I'd now like I'd now like to recognize the ranking member of the subcommittee, uh, the delegate from Puerto Rico, Mr. Pierre Luisi. Thank you, Chairman. I should say ranking member for a day, <laughs> but I am enjoying it. Um, actually, um, I'd say, for starters, that there's ample consensus in Puerto Rico, believe it or not, that we need more private capital in the energy sector. Even if you poll it, people want to see more companies like Equelectrica and AES, who's not here, represented, doing business in Puerto Rico. They want to see more renewable projects like the one Pattern Energy has. is a wind project in the south of Puerto Rico. Uh, even when you poll the people. The challenge is how you attract that capital to Puerto Rico. These days, very tough. What's happening is that Ms. Donahue, spent 15 months negotiating a restructuring, a debt restructuring deal with the major creditors of PREPA and uh, managed to get a deal from 70% of the creditors. The challenge now is how do we enforce it on all or at least attract all others to be part of this deal? Um, and I have to raise it. I have to raise the fact that we didn't have Chapter 9 when you started, and we still don't have it. And some really don't like Chapter 9 because it's bankruptcy and so on. But bear in mind that when you have Chapter 9, one of the benefits of it is that a federal bankruptcy judge can enforce the plan on all the creditors, all stakeholders. And you wouldn't have the issue that you still have today. So I raise that and I would like you to comment further as soon as I finish. The second issue I'm going to raise, which has been mentioned before here by several of the witnesses, is that we now have in Puerto Rico an energy commission, and that's important. I should acknowledge the presence of the president of the Senate of Puerto Rico, Eduardo Batia, who had a lead role in making that happen. It's important to have an energy commission because you need to regulate PREPA. PREPA is pretty much uh, like a monopoly. And so... One concern I'm raising, Ms. Donahue, and I want you to do, deal with it, is that I hear that part, this deal might not be respecting all the powers of the Energy Commission. I want to make sure that the Energy Commission will be approving any rate increase, and I don't want any, by the way, because it affects the economic development of Puerto Rico, uh, or any other charge. I want the Energy Commission to oversee your restructuring proposal. 
So please, could you comment on both of these angles? You know, the fact that it's hard to attract capital when you're not financially stable, which is PREPA's case. Secondly, Energy Commission. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, on, the, on the private capital, if I can expand on Mr. Um, San Miguel's comments, we did run a request for expression of interest proposal. We went out and we got enormous interest, both in PREPA and also in the greater Puerto Rico. But I will say that one caveat from all of the participants is a stable and fixed PREPA as a, as a counterparty. So the people that participated, the, pe the people that submitted proposals were real. They were real financial players, real operational players, and we are intending to use the results of that um, re request for expression of interest to help us hone the RFP to test the market and see the likelihood of actually getting private capital and getting it into, into PREPA. Um, as I mentioned in my short testimony and my long testimony, we want the best capital for the people of Puerto Rico and we want the fastest capital. And the only way we're going to determine the likelihood and really be able to analyze if it makes any sense is to go out for a proposal. So that's point one. Um, point two, as far as the Energy Commission, um, I have enormous respect for the Energy Commission. We have had several formal meetings and informal meetings, and we worked in parallel with them on the SILT regulation that came out in the fall. What the proposed um, PREPA Revitalization Act contemplated was not going around the Energy Commission. The only piece to that act is we did contemplate accelerating their approval process. We were never um, contemplating that they would not have full approval over the rate case that will be filed upon ultimate um, acceptance of the, regu the regulation. We had only contemplated changing a six-month approval process to a three-month approval process. And part of the reason for that is because of the very real possibility that PREPA will run out of cash in the summer, and because it was relying on the heavily negotiated contributions from the creditors that involved deleveraging as well as liquidity as a means to, to bridge that rate gap that I had talked about. So the commission is an important element to PREPA and to the people of Puerto Rico, and we are intending to continue working constructively with those folks. Thank you. The chair now recognizes the representative from the great state of Wyoming, Ms. Lummis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And this is my first introduction to this subject, so please bear with me and be kind of creative here. Uh, while I've never been to Puerto Rico, I don't speak Spanish. Um, I was my state's treasurer, and I worked on energy issues a lot. So this subject really piques my interest. Um, so I want to brainstorm with you a bit, so please bear with me. Um, let's assume that uh, a Chapter 9 bankruptcy authorization would occur. Uh, if it did, presumably, based on what I've heard, it would take very specific milestones as conditions precedent to this Congress allowing uh, Chapter 9 to be entered. And so I, wanna, I, I want to ask my questions based on that assumption. Let's assume we're going to authorize uh, uh, bankruptcy. But under, under oh, certain conditions would have to be met before it could ever be entered. Now, some of the things that I've heard that, that uh, if, if, if you thought that was the scenario that Congress was interested in considering, I want to know what some of those steps should be. And I want some of you to tell me what DOI and DOE have started with regard to assisting with improvements. So somebody be thinking about that question. I want to know what kind of milestones, specific milestones, we would have to enact prior to, as conditions precedent to authorizing um, a bankruptcy, how we can separate the Puerto Rican Congress from 
um, interference with PREPA, how we can work towards privatizing, uh, so to speak, uh, PREPA, uh, how um, uh, DOE specifically is, is discussing uh, debt guarantees or modifications to tax credits. I know that's a mouthful, but that's only the beginning for, for me, but since I've blown through half of my time, uh, just please have at it. I, I would uh, start if I was a bankruptcy judge, and I'm not a lawyer, and I've never been in bankruptcy court, uh, but a lot of people have been talking about it in Puerto Rico for PREPA, uh, uh, particularly. Uh, uh, given dire situation, everybody understands. I would start by um, uh, saying, well, going forward, if this is going to be a viable business, under what regulatory framework? Yeah. And I would say the strongest uh, countries. Can I interrupt you? What, if, what does the Energy Commission do now? Does it function like a public it, service commission? It, uh, it battles in court to get uh, PREPA to hand over documentation. Oh, man. Uh, it uh, it uh, asks interveners to, uh, 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 for help in, in framing the correct questions regarding the integrated resource plan uh, 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 that would be key to uh, private capital uh, coming in because they understand that the ratepayers will be able to uh, 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 finance the burden. Eventually, it's going to be in the backs of the, of, of the rate payers. Those are the people financing uh, the electoral system uh, okay. anywhere in the world. So, so, so I think it's, it's key that, um, that you have the strongest regulatory body because that, that's where those decisions are made. May I, may I ask Mr. San Miguel to weigh in on this huge array of questions I've asked? <laughs> sure. Uh, thank you. Um, a couple of thoughts. I mean, the, the, that just the, the specter of Chapter Nine. Let me say, and, I, and I, certainly in my my short and long version uh, into the committee, did not uh, touch that subject um, as I did not believe it was uh, part of the jurisdiction or the subject matter to be evaluated. But now that it's on the floor, so to speak, I I have to say that, and, and even going to the response that Mr. Rossi provides, I would say that, for example, on the prepa scenario. I wouldn't grant any kind of potential specter or access to Chapter 9 if they don't do the things I've outlined. The, the, things that, the three steps I've outlined are all within Puerto Rico's control. Mm -hmm. They can happen tomorrow. And I wouldn't come beg as an American citizen from the Congress unless I've done everything I can and then I need more. And under that scenario, I would then go ahead and plead for additional support with the credibility and the track record that I have done what I can, some may remain, and I need some assistance to finish the job. Having said that, on the Chapter 9 issue, I think I, I, I feel very strongly, and I, I, I differ a bit from our, our Congressman Pierre Luisi, who I trust uh, tremendously and, and have known for over 25 years. On the Chapter 9 issue, as a person who believes in, in our right to statehood, I, I can't think of it unless we resolve the political relations issue with Puerto okay. Rico. Uh, and for that, we have H.R. 727, which he has, uh, I think, very uh, properly sponsored. Um, but I, I, can't, I can't, as a jurisdiction, ask for more stateside rights without the responsibilities. Uh, and pr principally, and certainly, uh, Congressman Pierre Luisi aside, because he, he also believes in the statehood cause, the principal proponents of this from Puerto Rico are people who do not wish to become a state. So they want the goodies of the state, but none of the responsibilities. Mm -hmm. So fundamentally, I have an issue with that. Now, from a credibility perspective, you were asking, what should we do as precondition? What should the Congress do as precondition? You know, the first precondition is credibility. We are running now into the third fiscal year with no financial audited statements. S&P came out early January with their own assessment. Our local think tank, the Center for the New Economy came out publicly in December with that. How can you grant someone the right to go bankrupt if they haven't shown you the numbers? Yeah, I, and I thank you. I, my time has expired, but this is fascinating. Um, uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Okay. Thank you. The chair now recognizes the uh, ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Grijalva. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And uh, Ms. Donahue, uh, let me just some quick questions. Would it be easier to raise money to upgrade uh, Puerto Rico's aging energy infrastructure that's been talked about here with or without uh, Chapter 9? Well, with, with the Chapter 9, presumably we'd be able to get super priority financing. So potentially that, that could be used as, as a bridge. Um, but, I, if but, I can just expand quickly, though, what, what we're talking about as part of our plan is trying to fund it, just to correct what um, Mr. Rossi said. Part of the plan is funded by the concessions with, from the creditors. Part of the upgrade in the system is, is funded by that. And I just want to make sure that, that people are clear on that. Thank you. Uh, would ratepayers have lower bills uh, with or without Chapter 9? I, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, okay. Uh, would manufacturers and other businesses be more likely to set up to invest in Puerto Rico with or without Chapter 9? I, I can't answer that, but what I can say is, and this goes a bit toward your earlier question, with, with the Chapter 9, at least as it relates to PREPA, I would use it as a mechanism to facilitate the deal that we have on the table. The deal that we've negotiated with the creditors is good with a Chapter 9, without a Chapter 9. It's fair, it's equitable. So where a Chapter 9 would make sense for PREPA is to facilitate the deal very quickly. It would pull in the holdouts to the extent that there are holdouts so we don't have an Argentina problem. It would okay. allow us to very quickly move on to the next phase and the milestones are outlined in the restructuring support agreement. It involves an RFP. It involves acceptable legislation. It that wouldn't be begging at that point. <laughs> uh, you mentioned, uh, Ms. Donahue, in your testimony that restructuring support agreement does not include the 30 percent uh, PREPA debt. If PREPA had access to Chapter 9, wouldn't any restructuring include 100 percent of that debt and therefore mean uh, a, bigger payer do a, a bigger savings down the road for ratepayers? Yes, it would. And uh, one, uh, one concern I have about the concern I have about the restructuring support agreement is that, that you've reached with some of PREPA's creditors is that ratepayers are still will be left paid for a lot of the debt while the hedge funds who paid pennies on the dollar for the debt are guaranteed 85 percent on the dollar under this pending agreement. Wouldn't, uh, wouldn't you get a better deal for Puerto Rican families and PREPA under Chapter 9 then through the RSA, given, given those numbers? You know, it, it's not clear to me that the economics of the deal would change in a Chapter 9. Um, the PREPA bonds are arguably special revenue bonds. So whether we, which is why I'd mentioned, I think the deal that we've constructed independent of the secondary market considerations is a fair deal. It gets PREPA deleveraging as well as liquidity relief in the form of five years interest only payment. So I'm not sure that a Chapter 9 would get a better economic deal. It would get a more efficient deal. But as far as the 85 five year interest only, I'm not convinced of that, no. And, and the last question, and I, I noticed that as, as uh, in the, rest in the, in the RSA and the restructuring for PREPA, the, uh, the heavy reliance on, on, on natural grass is the, uh, to, to replace one fossil fuel. Uh, and uh, in that plan, did, was, the, did, was there a look at renewables as part of the portfolio that would be provided, i.e., you know, Hawaii, 20 percent of the island, uh, is renewable, Virgin Islands, 20 percent solar power during peak periods, even Texas, 20 percent <laughs> wind power. So my point being, in setting up a portfolio, aren't we begging the question that we're removing one reliance on one fossil fuel, replacing a reliance almost entirely on natural gas, 
uh, without a portfolio that's ample enough to accommodate renewables? The, the IRP and the PREPA transformation plan does rely on fuel diversification and as part of that does integrate renewables into the system over what time. What percentage of, those, of that in that RTA would you say is a, a renewable part of the renewable Well, we're proposal. going from 200 megawatts of commercial grade up to approximately 1,200 by the, by the end of the IRP. One of the challenges that a system like PREPA has is we'd mentioned the age of the fleet. Okay. And with the older fleet, we have very inflexible units. So in order to make sure that we have system reliability, we have to carefully integrate and make sure that the systems, when we get newer units that can power up and down, we can integrate faster. Thank you. The Chair now recognizes Mr. Thompson for questions. Thank you, Chairman. Um, thank, you for the, uh, thank you to the witnesses uh, for being here. Um, I, I want to uh, talk about or ask questions, uh, get some clarifications on the, uh, 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 the Agarum facility and the conversion to uh, uh, LNG. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm from Pennsylvania. We've had our own uh, economic issues. And, uh, but one of the things that's been really, um, really a godsend for us has been the, the use of natural gas. And specifically, one of those has been looking at uh, actually the construction of even new power plants using that, that resource. And so I want to just get a clarification in terms of, of what was uh, the situation in Puerto Rico. In uh, 2012, a report by Alvarez and Marshall that was presented before the Government Development Bank of Puerto Rico suggests the future of PREPA depends upon converting to natural gas for power generation. Uh, the findings is uh, furthered in the integrated resources plan that was released by PREPA earlier this year. And indeed, PREPA premises must of it, much of its future compliance with environmental regulations, including mercury, air toxin standards, on the, the development of the Garum uh, facility, which uh, PREPA concludes will provide uh, 900 MW, a uh, million watts of compliant, clean, liquid natural gas power. Uh, Ms. Donahue, what's the current status of the um, Aguirrem uh, facility? The Aguirre gas port, we, our environmental impact study is complete. We are now dealing with comments from the Corps of Engineers that came right before the Christmas holidays. And working with our partners, we are um, hoping to to continue to move that along. Our expectation is begin construction sometime 2016, second to third quarter, depending on the permitting issues, and have it COD by the end of 2017 into early 2018. Thank you. In reading the IRP, it appears that much of the future of PREPA is dependent on the, uh, obviously, the improvement and the construction of, of uh, that facility. Um, um, Ms. Donahue, what will PREPA do if, the, uh, if that facility fails to, to come online? Well, as you know, it is um, a big piece of our IRP and therefore also getting to EPA compliance on, on mass regulations. However, what we have looked at, because we do need a fallback plan, is we have, um, I have an oil and gas expert on, as part of my team who's been working with the Echoelectrica folks to understand the permits, the expansion, et cetera, because as um, Mr. Um, Sanabrea just testified, they have a natural gas terminal and they have gasification. Um, so we have looked at that. We've looked at the timing of the permits, and that would, of course, require a pipeline to move it beyond uh, Echoelectrica. So that is a fallback that we have been considering, but we are moving forward with the Aguirre gas plant right now. Very good. Uh, Mr. San Miguel, uh, if, if, the, um, if this facility is not constructed, what, what opportunities in the private sector exist to expand electric generation on the island that is both environmentally compliant and financially feasible? Sure. Uh, the, the first thought uh, upon your premise of, of if Aguirre offshore gas plant doesn't occur was You've, you've got to really accelerate the, uh, the R, any RFP process on the generation side. 
Uh, I mean, I think Equelectrica is obviously a, a, a natural um, plan B, so to speak. Um, although I, I'm a strong believer in, uh, you know, we, we can't create uh, another another mini monopoly. Mm -hmm. So competition is healthy. Uh, I like uh, Jaime Sanabria very much. Uh, he's done a very good job over the years. But I would really press the pedal to the metal to make sure that we had competing power generation sources and uh, capital that uh, in competing makes it more efficient, more uh, cost effective, and less uh, expensive for customers. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Sanabria, uh, could the elect Echo Electria facility be expanded to accommodate an increased LNG intake, and if so, by how much and how much potential uh, megawatts could be uh, produced based on that uh, increased intake? Well, the, the existing LNG facility at Echo Electrica, in terms of regasification capacity, could expand by 50 percent as we speak today, subject to authorization from FERC. That authorization, it is our estimate that would take a year to uh, work with the permits and get uh, FERC comfortable to authorize it. And that expansion does not uh, require any construction at all. In addition to that, Equelectrica has the facility ready for uh, development and construction of a second LNG tank. That second LNG tank could expand by 100 percent the existing Equelectrica capacity should it get the additional 50 percent expanded. So we can, we can go from approximately 24 to 26 cargo standard cargos of LNG of 119,000 cubic meters each to uh, three times, that, almost three times that, up to 60 cargos a year. So that means we would be able to power not only uh, additional uh, power such as uh, Equelectrica and Costa Azul, which together uh, they both uh, represent about 1,300 megawatts. We could power an additional, let's say, 500 megawatts with the 50 percent increase up to 1,800 and double that capacity with an additional second tank. The only thing is that the second tank is, a, is another process of its own. It'll take probably close to five years to initiate all the permitting, go through FERC, then after FERC, financing and constructing the tank. It will take about five years. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. The Chair now recognizes a member of the subcommittee, Mr. Polis, from the great state of Colorado. Thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman from Colorado as well. I appreciate that. Um, before I jump into my questions, I want to uh, briefly mention how peripheral many of the topics in today's hearings are in light of the crippling debt crisis facing Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico holds over $70 billion in public debt that without access to Chapter 9 and an opportunity to restructure their debt, is effectively unpayable. And of course, while uh, we're discussing energy development, uh, an issue that no doubt is important in its own right, I don't see how it's even possible to de-link uh, PREPA's financial challenges from Chapter 9, uh, which I think uh, has to be dealt with in terms of how, how Puerto Rico can emerge from this crisis, uh, not just with regard to uh, energy policy within Puerto Rico. Ms. Donahue, um, your written testimony uh, notes how fragile the restructuring support agreement is for PREPA. Can you expand on how important it is for additional PREPA creditors to join the agreement and how necessary it is for PREPA to have access to Title to Chapter 9 bankruptcy? Yes. The restructuring support agreement requires that after um, the exchange, only 700 million of debt of the, of the current existing bonds remain outstanding. So that means of the $2.7 billion of debt that is currently not part of the restructuring support agreement, $2 billion of it must voluntarily exchange. If they do not, then we, we can't consummate the deal. And what happens if the outstanding creditors, which I, about 30 percent of the debt, are not party to the restructuring support agreement? Well, the, the deal can't be consummated unless we get two billion of them to agree. The deal consummates 700 million cannot participate, but the other two billion must. And um, without debt relief, uh, PREPA is projected to run out of cash uh, in June of this year, so in about five months, and default on its debt, ob debt obligations. What are the short and long-term impacts of a default both to PREPA, its customers, and to Puerto Rico? Well, I, th I think that PREPA faced it in July of 2014, which was the inflection point to getting a CRO and actually getting the negotiation point. There was an issue where um, the main fuel supplier at the time was Petrobras refused to ship 
um, without cash in advance. So if there is no suppliers that will be willing to supply fuel, then that would mean that they won't be able to generate power. Um, and that would also mean then that we would be in a situation where there would have to be blackouts and, and major, major conservation. It would be, in my opinion, a disaster if, if PREPA were to run out of cash and not have the ability to provide And these power. are both residential blackouts as well as businesses that would lose power as well? It would be blackouts across the island, yes. Yeah, which, um, you know, in terms of maintaining competitiveness and jobs in the tax base, um, that would evaporate uh, very quickly if uh, there was not a reliable power source. Um, <clears throat> one thing that I notice in the background is that <clears throat> Um, unlike most areas in the mainland, Puerto Rico uses uh, a bit of, quite a bit of fuel oil with regard to power generation. Uh, and I'd like to, and whoever's area of expertise this is, uh, the impact of the, the reduction of um, oil prices from about $90 a barrel down to $30 a barrel, uh, how much does that lead to a cost reduction of electricity in the island of Puerto Rico? It's been a significant factor. The initiatives that the team has implemented has resulted in approximately one cent. The difference between the high point when of August of 2014, when it was about 28, 29, it's now closer to 17 or 18. I also saw that Puerto Rico has a renewable portfolio standard of 12% by 2015 <clears throat> and 15% by 2020. To put that in contrast to the state that Mr. Lamborn and I hail from, uh, we have a 30% renewable energy portfolio standard by 2020, roughly twice that of Puerto Rico. Uh, Ms. Donahue, would you be able to address how higher renewable portfolio standards can lead to more predictable electricity pricing over time and make uh, the economy less subject to spikes in oil prices? Well, I think what it would do is it would allow the um, fuel diversification that we talked about. You'd have less reliance. But until there is stored power, solar still remains intermittent. Mm -hmm. So you still would need the reserve power. And unlike Colorado, the great state of Colorado, we don't have the ability to um, shed load. We, we are a closed system. So it's that much more important that we have the reserve power and the backup power to make sure that when the sun doesn't shine, that the power and the system can still reliably provide. So that's part of the reason why our standards are lower because of the older systems. And once we have newer systems that can power up and power down much faster, we can integrate much faster. Uh, I thank the chairman for the time and hope that we can soon uh, continue our committee's work with the issues surrounding Chapter 9, and I yield back. Well, we would, except that's outside the jurisdiction of our committee. Uh, the chair now recognizes the gentleman from Idaho, Mr. Labrador. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I want to thank each and every one of you for uh, being here today. Uh, before I begin my questioning, I really want to make an important point, something that I'm very concerned about, that nothing said in this hearing, nothing said by the leadership of this conference or this Congress should in any way be interpreted as encouraging the government of Puerto Rico or PREPA to delay addressing their own fiscal situations. I think that's really, really important. I and other members of Congress will not support federal legislative action on this issue if those responsible for the debt do not act in good faith to work to come up with their own viable solutions. You don't need Congress to help you be responsible. There's a lot of things that you can do to become responsible. Significant reforms must be made and serious negotiations with creditors should be undertaken and finalized, including the restructuring agreement that PREPA reached with its creditors in December. Ms. Donahue, thank you for being here today. If the Puerto Rican legislature fails to pass both the operational and securitization portions of the legislation by January 22nd, what happens? Two things happen. Um, the restructuring support agreement will no longer be valid, and we have negotiated with our creditors that they will lend back to us $115 million that we paid in January to help us bridge our liquidity crisis, that will also, they will not be required to do that as well. Thank you. Briefly, could you describe the additional provisions that you're seeking the legislature to approve? It, it 
comes in, we're looking for an ability to actually implement a meritocracy, meaning key performance indicators and bonuses based on performance. We're looking for the ability for PREPA to run an RFP process, which would go out and, t and understand the appetite of private capital. We are looking for um, securitization. Hmm. Um, the ability for a, a rate restructure, which would then we would go to the Energy Commission for approval on, and th those are the main components. That's right. It's not a test. I was just, just trying to get it. <laughs> you got me a little nervous. All right. <laughs> There's been talk about the need to bifurcate this legislation. Would that work? Why or why not? At the Puerto Rican level? The yeah. I believe it won't work, and I believe the reason why it won't work, and when you say bifurcate, I'm assuming you mean take the securitization Correct. and all the other. The, the PREPA transformation is important in that it deals with operational issues, culture issues, and financial issues, financial issues. They are all intertwined. I think if we bifurcate and only focus on the securitization, that would only deal with one element of all of the issues that are happening at PREPA, and we need to be able to really depoliticize, instill a cultural meritocracy, get the savings that are embedded in other elements of the legislation. So I think it's important that the legislation, the elements of it are together. So we need to make hard choices, is what you're saying, correct? Yes. Uh, Mr. San Miguel, Jorge, good to see you. Uh, as someone living on the island and having worked with PREPA in the past to negotiate power purchase operating agreements, are these legislative fixes necessary, and would they help PREPA operate in the future? Hmm. Uh, and your reference is to the Re Re Revitalization Correct. Act. Uh, you know, as I mentioned in my short uh, piece, uh, Congressman, um, I don't think it's, it's a perfect piece, but it's, a, a, it's a, a, a move way ahead of where PREPA has been. Uh, and so I urge that, yes, it be approved with the amendments that, that should properly be made without discouraging the creditor group that's already been um, agreeable to the revitalization draft that we have in front of the legislature. Um, I think it's important that all, all of this revolves around the fact of whether Puerto Rico truly wants to reform PREPA. Mm -hmm. I believe it's a separate issue from Chapter 9, and that's why I would I, like I too, not to by the way. touch that, because I think that Ms. Donahue and the team, the CRO team at PREPA has done a tremendous job. Fifteen months is a bit misleading, in my opinion, from the outside. Uh, Ms. Donahue was brought in, and she's not just done debt restructuring work. She's done structural reform work and has been, I think, assigned additional duties. So what she found there was not as easy as was originally designed or thought. And 15 months under that scenario, I don't think it's that bad. Uh, any scenario under other legal structures or pathways would have taken probably that much for this type of size of debt and complexity uh, within Puerto Rico. And real quick, Ms. Donahue, I'm really concerned about PREPA's history of not collecting from municipal accounts and that PREPA has not pursued collection for se severely past due accounts. What are we doing now and what needs to be done? What else needs to be done? Is there something legislatively or is it just PREPA just needs to do its, its job better? Well, I think um, the legislative component has already been passed with Act 57 that happened two years ago that outlined measures and um, limits to each of the different municipalities. And then further to that, the Energy Com Commission came out in the fall with regulation that further strengthened the for-profit elements of the municipalities and carved them out of the silt and also um, strengthened the ability above the limits that PREPA has the ability to collect the cash. Um, as far as collections from governments and other customers, my team has been working tirelessly with the folks on the ground where we have restructured that whole organization reconciled accounts and have um, set up multiple payment plans and, and the cash balances that were quoted earlier um, have been significantly reduced. Thank you very much. I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, Chair now recognizes Mr. Toronto for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> and thank you to both the committee and the subcommittee for allowing myself and Ms. Velasquez to participate. While we are not members of this committee, we were both born in Puerto Rico, and uh, uh, Puerto Rico is never far from our heart or our legislative thoughts, or our thoughts in general. So I thank you. Uh, Ms. Donahue, I have a question uh, that concerns me a lot. Uh, a recent AP report 
indicated the PREPA was about to cut off electricity from several hospitals in Puerto Rico. Now, we, Ms. Velasquez has been saying that this is becoming not a fiscal crisis, but a humanitarian crisis. I believe, and I may be wrong, and maybe Nidia can help me, that in New York you're not allowed to shut off uh, heat or, or purposely uh, of senior citizens, for instance, in wintertime, the, their lights and so on. So how does PREPA get away with uh, cutting off electricity to hospitals? And doesn't that just make things worse? from a fiscal crisis to a humanitarian crisis and, and a, a health issue. And speaking of health issues, please forgive my throat. That's okay. Um, let me just clarify. PREPA did actually not cut off the power. They posted a notice as required by law in the paper that if they did not pay, they would be entitled to cut off power. And what ended up happening is they paid. They paid? Yes. So this issue then is gone? The issue is gone. Now, are there any laws in Puerto Rico at this time? And it's probably a question if we had the President of the Senate on the panel, but we don't, uh, that prohibit uh, uh, groups like yours or agencies like yours from cutting off power uh, without some sort of, 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 uh, of negotiating or, or something or preventing it totally? I'm... I'm not, I, I'm not an expert on all Puerto Rican laws, I'm sorry, but what I will say is, in, again, in this particular instance, there were many efforts to negotiate um, to the extent that we were intending to ever cut off power. We followed the procedure where we're required to notice, and as I said, once we filed the procedure that we had the ability to do it, we were able to get paid. So as far as what other requirements there are, I'd have to defer that to my colleagues who are actually in the department, the collection group. Okay, we'd like to know that. I think, uh, with all due respect, I think the committee may want to know that. And lastly, on this part, uh, are there other hospitals that are in arrears right now or any medical institutions, any schools uh, that are in arrears? The Department of Education is definitely in arrears. Um, I off, I'm going to have to get back to you on the specifics of individual accounts, but I am aware that we are trying to work out a payment plan with the Department of Education as well. Okay. Um, for anyone on the panel who wishes to answer this, and it's a question we ask ourselves here all the time, many would say why during a fiscal crisis have a hearing on, en on the energy issue in Puerto Rico. What is, briefly, the relationship between energy issues and the economy and the fiscal crisis right now? Anyone who wants to watch that? Yes, sir. Thank you, Congressman. Um, <clears throat> you know, w one of the things I mentioned in my short piece uh, was the power quality issue. Um, I mean, generally speaking, the energy and electricity is the backbone of our society, of our island, and our, our homes and businesses. One little item on power quality that has to do with voltage and, and sustainability of that voltage, for example, is affecting our capacity to attract new manufacturing investment, and it's threatening existing manufacturing. There are, for example, 10 manufacturing entities on the island that currently produce or generate, I should say, almost a third of the revenues, tax collections for the government of Puerto Rico. If, if we don't take care of that sort of infrastructure ailment, we threaten not just a hospital, we threaten thousands of jobs and 33% or 30% of our general revenues right now. Uh, so there are huge elements behind this, the importance and significance of this energy infrastructure crisis that we are so near and close to finalizing with the RSA, approval by the legislature, action, quick action, I should say, by the Energy Commission, and then letting the CRO and the PREPA team go on the securitization and the rest of the issues that must be taken care of. Now, just a footnote. Chapter 9, no judge under Chapter 9 is going to approve me the Re Revitalization Act. They're not going to approve me the rates. They're not going to approve me the IRP and they're not going to help me with securitization. In fact, Chapter 9 Spectre could actually lower the possibilities of getting positive credit rating on a securitization structure. So 
we're very close without having this dark cloud near us. I think delinking this from chapter 9 is critical. We are very close to getting a PREPA transaction done. With respect to the holdouts, I think, I don't know the, I'm not privy to the details of the mm. transaction, but if the offer made under the RSA is above their, tra their current trading price, which is pretty low, it's likely those holdouts will come in. And if they don't come in, the deal doesn't necessarily fall through. Existing creditors could step in for part of that debt. So I think we need to be very cautious and not introduce into a very advanced negotiating stage something that could be very unsettling and does not resolve my mm. Revitalization Act approval, my energy rates revisions, and my IRP uh, completion. I, I, will, I, I will also like to add, if you allow me, okay, uh, being the representative of the manufacturing sector and the private sector, you know, energy is one of the main components of the equation called operation costs. Example today, in the local news, Procter and Gamble, after 30 years, is closing their facility, you know, uh, and they are going to be eliminating 230 jobs. And basically, you know, one of the reasons stated in the, in the, in the, in the communication was that operational cost challenges. You will never hear energy, 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 but when you talk to colleagues, you know that energy is a very important component. And one of the main issues that we have had been fighting for the last 15 years is this trend going up, up, up. The uncertainty that the whole situation brings is holding investments in the manufacturing facilities that typically are geared towards improving capacity, bringing new products in. And in reality, when you look at the whole scenario, you know, everybody is waiting to see what happens. And in reality, what we need now and not tomorrow is, again, cheaper energy costs that when I compare, you know, uh, let's say when I look at Singapore, I look at Costa Rica, I look at the Dominican Republic, and I, lo I look at Puerto Rico at twice those rates, you know, I cannot compete even inside, you know, the manufacturing networks uh, that we already have. So it's a very, very tough challenge. And I want to say lastly that it's important that whatever we, we talk here, uh, you know, sustained economic development is, is, is key, that whatever we do in energy is in a sustained way, and we, the private sector, want to work with you doing that, because you know what, if not in five or ten years, we'll be here talking again about the same issue. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Rivera. Thank you, Mr. I, Chairman. Thank you. Uh, now, uh, recognize uh, the gentleman from Michigan, Dr. Benchak, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you all for being here uh, this morning. Uh, apparently, the PREPA's power generation is a combination of PREPA-owned generation as well as contracted uh, power generation. Um, what's your opinion as to whether that combination should be changed? Ms. Donahue? I, I think that for sure the Echoelectrica facilities and the AES facilities, as other witnesses have testified, are more efficient and cheaper energy providers than the outdated PREPA systems. So one of the things that we are looking at is the possibility of going out for an RFP to determine the best way to get the most reliable, cheapest form of capital and ultimately source of power onto the island. So we're, okay. we're looking at that, yes. All right. Mr. Santa Bria, do you have an opinion there? Well, we believe, and I said it in my, in my uh, testimony, that PREPA should look at privatizing uh, its operations, uh, actually either through actual privatization or through uh, private management of the utility. The generation piece, obviously, would be more uh, competitive and it would contribute more in terms of lower cost to Puerto Rico if it were completely uh, privatized to compete one with the other. Thank you. Uh, apparently, the, an Alvarez and Marshall presentation on June 11, 2012 suggested that the future for PREPA depends on converting to natural gas uh, for power generation but there's very little natural gas infrastructure. Uh, they say that there should be an either LNG or via a pipeline, but neither one of these things has happened. Can new uh, gas infrastructure be achieved? Um, what's the solution there, Ms. Donahue? Do you have an um, answer? Yes. Um, 
the Aguirre Gasport is the project that's currently under consideration and has gone through most of the permitting process. We still have some questions with the Army Corps of Engineers and we're hoping to resolve that shortly so that we can finalize the permitting process, begin construction and have the Aguirre Natural Gas Port online by the end of 2017, beginning of 2018. Mr. Sanabria, do you have any comments as well? Oh, we, we mentioned a little while ago that there's capability of expanding in Ecoelectrica's case the existing uh, LNG terminal. So that's that's an option that PREPA has. Uh, obviously, they, they have the IRP in process, and it's to their best interest to do the, the most uh, uh, effective and efficient uh, uh, development for PREPA. But uh, the options are there to, to increase the uh, intake of LNG into the island and to maximize its use in power generation. All right. Thank you. Well, this just really emphasizes the, the importance of energy in our economy. And, and to me, Puerto Rico is sort of a microcosm of, the, of our entire country. You know, we are uh, subject to increased energy costs, uh, subject because we have standards that we want to have a clean environment. And other places around the world do not have those standards. And they are out competing us uh, for industry because we are not taking a strong stance on our international partners on making sure that we have a clean planet and really excessively harming our industry here. So I think I really appreciate your testimony as to the struggles of the manufacturing uh, sector, Mr. Velez, and your, your comments about your competition in, in the area and uh, encourage us to find solutions so that we're not uncompetitively cha challenged by our partners and our neighbors. Thank you. I'll reel back. Gentleman yells back. Please uh, recognize Mrs. Valaquez for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I, too, want to thank uh, the committee for allowing Congressman Serrano and myself to be here. As you know, we were born in Puerto Rico, and uh, we have almost five million Puerto Ricans in the mainland who really care deeply about what's going on in Puerto Rico. I too believe that uh, PREPA, uh, the monopoly, has to come to an end. We need to diversify uh, the energy sector in Puerto Rico. Uh, but we, and I do agree with my colleague, uh, uh, Labrador, in saying that Puerto Rico has to take responsibility. But I too will say that Congress also has to take responsibility. It was Congress who gave Puerto Rico bankruptcy protection from 1933 to 1984. When the law was reformed, <coughs> Puerto Rico was excluded. When you check the congressional record, no reason whatsoever why Puerto Rico was excluded. So that is one. What about Medicare and Medicaid parity for American citizens who gladly, when they are called to go to war and participate in every single conflict, we show up. So we deserve, Puerto Ricans, American citizens in Puerto Rico deserve to have the same um, uh, parity that we enjoyed here in the mainland. And also, is the lack of uh, uniformity when it comes to the territories. When you look at the Virgin Islands and the Jones Act, when you look at how much reimbursement they get compared to Medicaid and Medicare for Puerto Rico, there's a lack of uniformity. So, and then we provided tax incentives that were taken away to promote economic development in Puerto Rico, and we didn't replace that with anything. But here we are, dealing with a fiscal crisis. Uh, Ms. Donahue, uh, your testimony and your response to uh, my colleague, uh, Representative Paulis, uh, notes how fragile the RSA is. It requires that holders of more than $2 billion in bonds to still come to the table it requires that the new bonds receive an investment grade rating. Given the island's economy 
deterioration rapidly, uh, and the creditor house holdouts persisting, how likely do you believe it is for the RSA to be executed? I, thank you. I, I like to be an optimist, and I'd like to say that the RSA will be executed because all of us, not just the PREPA team, but the creditors and their advisors as well, worked very hard on coming up with a fair and balanced solution. I, I do think that getting the, the two billion of holders, which some, some are retail holders, not all of them are hedge funds, some of them are original issuers as well, mm -hmm. so they're at 100%, um, will be a challenge. I think uh, another challenge is the requirement for the investment grade rating, and that, of course, is needed to get the interest rate savings as part of the deal. And we can't look at PREPA as a microcosm, it can't be looked at standalone because so many of its customers are, are um, the government and also its customers are the manufacturing base in Puerto Rico. So I do think at least in part the investment grade rating will depend on what's happening in the, the macro commonwealth. Let's assume for, a, you know, as a point of discussion, if these conditions are not met, they RSA falls apart, it will fall apart. It, it would fall apart. We would, we would certainly have to be back at then, the table with our creditors. Okay. So we recognize how tenuous uh, the RSA is, but many are suggesting that since an RSA is in place, PREPA is in the clear. And when you look at from the New York Times article to Bloomberg, or, all the papers, they just uh, look at this as, you know, Puerto Rico is coming out and we're going to have a real solution. The whole discussion is to demonstrate that without Chapter 9, it's going to be an uphill battle. Don't you think so? Well, it, as I mentioned, I think that for for PREPA, I think we would use Chapter 9 as part of a prepackaged deal. We've got the agreement with our creditors. We would use it to more efficiently um, accomplish and facilitate the restructuring that's, that's on the table. Um, I, I don't think you can say that PREPA is completely done. I think the RSA, although, again, highly negotiated, highly structured, good faith, good intentioned, there are contingencies that must be met. And if they're not met, we will be back at the table. And you're going to have thousands and thousands of Puerto Ricans leaving the island, coming here to the mainland. You know, Mr. Chairman, I think that it is the responsibility. And I know uh, someone raised the issue that this is not the committee of jurisdiction when it comes to bankruptcy. Uh, well, but the administration uh, sent a proposal here with four pillars, and one of them is territorial bankruptcy that will fall under the jurisdiction of this committee. Um, we need to do something, and I hope that collectively we seek for a legislative solution that will provide the kind of uh, peace to the people in Puerto Rico and the choice and the options for Puerto Ricans to deal with their own destiny and for people to be able to make the choice to stay in Puerto Rico and not being forced out of the island to come to the mainland. Thank you, and I yield back. Gentlelady's time has expired. The chair now recognizes the distinguished chairman of the Full Natural Resource Committee, Mr. Bishop, for five minutes. Thank you. Let me hit a couple of questions here quickly, and I'm going to stay within five minutes. <laughs> so uh, first of all, Ms. Donahue, if, if, if I could ask you, in your testimony, you summarized basically that PREPA needs financial restructuring, operational improvements, federal permits for an LNG facility, energy loan guarantees, government's reforms, and the Legislative Assembly to approve the RSA. Uh, I'm assuming that all of these are critical to remain a viable entity, but how many of these are in PREPA's control? The Operational efficiencies are in PREPA's control, and we're executing on those. The rest are simply out of... The, you, the rest are... are you need some assistance to do that. that. That's 
I wanted to think through it, but that's correct. Does PREPA have uh, the so-called trust employees, and, and what are trust employees? PREPA does have trust employees. Um, PREPA has approximately 170 trust employees, and the trust employees are what they sound like. They're, they're, trust, they're trusted people that are, that are put in with the administrative um, changes. All right. Uh, Mr. Senebrera, I hope I'm even coming close to that name. Sure. Echo Electrica originally entered into a 22-year contract with PREPA. How many years do you have left on that contract? Six years. Um, your testimony, you noted, without a surety of payment, it will be difficult for anybody to justify itself in Puerto Rico energy sector. How does that statement actually relate to Echo Electrica? Well, Echo Electrica, and, and what we wanted to do was present the facts as they exist today. Echo Electrica, for the last eight years, has experienced that uh, or has been collecting from PREPA on a pass to basis. Our, our receivables are not current. PREPA is not paying on a current basis. But, but as soon as Ms. Donahue stepped in as Chief Restructuring Officer, we are able to sit and negotiate a scheme for payment, and she's been meeting that for the last year and a half, and, and we have been able to continue to operate, and our investors right. are content with the environment right now as it stands. But, but it doesn't uh, take away the matter that our receivables, in terms of past due, uh, are all, uh, on an average at around 30 days over the contract terms, and the contract terms itself were 47 days after the close of the month. So, so receivables are collected on a 77 uh, calendar okay. day basis or above that. I've got it. How, so then how do you envision Puerto Rico recovering its credit worthiness? Well, I, I think there's and, a And you've got like one minute to do that. I'm sorry. There's, a, there's many steps Puerto Rico needs to take. Uh, first of all, is realize that it needs to meet all its commitments. Contractual commitments are signed because you intend to meet them. So from that perspective, uh, you need to ingrain or install that, that uh, framework of mind now. Now... The way we, we envision that we may proceed would be uh, if there was some type of assistance or aid, be it in the form of guarantees, be it in the form of, uh, of other types of, of assistance that can help Equelectrica and any, any future investor uh, feel so would those Would those guarantees then give what you said, your deficiency of certainty? in legal and a regulatory framework, would those guarantees be part of that process? That would be part of the process. But also, the legislature in Puerto Rico needs to realize that uh, they cannot focus uh, on determining, if, if that's the right word, the contractual relationships that exist whenever legislation is right. enacted. So you need a legislative assistance at the same time. Let me yield one minute to Mr. Labrador, if I could. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just quickly, I, I completely agree with Ms. Velasquez that there's a lot of things that we could do, but I agree with Mr. San Miguel, and I think he said it better than anybody else, that in order to get the goodies of statehood, you also need to have the responsibilities of a state, and that only comes through becoming a state. Really quickly, though, I think something you and I can, can agree on, I, th I think if I heard you correctly, Ms. Donahue, can you respond to the issue of the Jones Act? I think in your testimony you state that current impact on the Jones Act on PREPAS operations is in the range of three to five million per year and that this may increase to 20 to 30 million per year. Can you address how reform of the Jones Act would actually help PREPA and help the people of Puerto Rico? Yes. The Jones Act, as you know, requires American flagged vessels, American built vessels, and American crewed vessels. And Oh, because at the moment um, our sources are not uniquely mainland to get number six and number two to run our units, it, it's min minimal. When, we, when the Aguirre gas port becomes operational and we enter into long-term LNG contracts, one of the ways we've been able to save money is by index hedging, different indexes and buying from different parts of the world. If we don't have the ability or try, if we source from the U.S. that will be increased approximately 20 to 30 million based on usage. So that would save money and then would ultimately save the ratepayer as well. Address that issue as well. Do you agree with that? I think it's important that we have a better infrastructure to get LNG and natural gas into Puerto Rico and that it be structured in a way that's available to small business 
uh, and to uh, industrial 